Hello, my name is Roger Kerry. I'm a physiotherapist from the United Kingdom. I work at the University of Nottingham and I'm going to present a, um, a short talk now on evidence-based healthcare and N equals one. So the aim of this talk is really to give a positive deconstruction of the traditional idea of evidence-based healthcare previously known as evidence-based medicine um and sort of build it up again in light of um using the best of scientific evidence in a person-centered um, clinical framework and that was always the intention of the evidence the early evidence-based medicine model uh, but it seems like over the last 20 30 years um it's been characterized in a way it was never really meant to and then so my argument is there might be a prioritizing of sources of evidence now that we've got used to that may not be best fit for true person-centered care um, the cautionary point i'll come out with straight away is that this is not at all about dismissing scientific evidence in favor of something like patient preferences or acquiescing to patient wants or needs or anything. That's not what person-centered medicine is at all. We're trying to find a nice balance here between science, the clinical shop floor, and perhaps the bridge in between that thing is a clinical reasoning framework, which you'll which we'll sort of bring into it as well. So um, here's a picture of a, um, He's an 80 something year old fell runner in, in the north of England in the Lake District. His name is Joss Naylor and he's an incredible runner. Um, and he's, he runs 30 miles every day over the fells of the Lake District and he's still doing that. Interestingly, he's had back and leg pain since he was age 16, but he's never stopped running. Uh, here's a picture of Hank Williams. Um, the most famous country singer of all time. Hank Williams also had back pain, but he died of a cause related to his back pain when he was in his late twenties. So there's something there about back pain and the, the such a difference in the effect, if we want to frame these two characters in, in non-specific low back pain, this such a difference in the effect that that pain has on two different people so trying to understand the factors that that influence those different responses is really difficult and re research tries to do this all the time of course and it looks at characteristically similar and different features of different groups of people and things like that but we might have come to a point when actually the the world and specifically say the world of non-specific low back pain is so complex that actually it's difficult to get any meaningful answers from the sort of scientific methods that we try and approach it with um, at the moment and even the best of the trials looking at uh, causal factors in, in non-specific low back pain uh, have to sort of conclude ultimately that no matter how much you subgroup people um, you know to find the true causally differentiating factors between groups you you end up subgrouping down to the individual level so here's two individual people and the, obviously the assessment and the management of these two people would be quite different so it's finding a way to um still utilize what we learn from those population studies but but how on earth we we plug that into a real world which is so incredibly complex and context sensitive that actually standardized controlled uh, population comparative group studies might not get to the the true nature of what's going on um, of course i or we are not the first person people or person to identify their uh, problems with the traditional evidence-based medicine um, 30 years is a good time, you know, if we, if we take the, the, the Guyatt and Sackett model of evidence-based medicine as our framework, which the early 1990s, so 30 years down the line or so, is a, it's a good period of time to look back um, and, and work out what's been going on with, with, with healthcare practice 
since the advent of this module. So we're actually at a perfect time to, to ex in a scientific, a history of science and a philosophy of science way, it's a really good time period for us to be able to explore some things. So Trish Greenhouse and colleagues um, produced this a few years ago, Movement in Crisis, identifying the, perhaps the um, erroneous tr track, the tr trajectory that evidence-based medicine um, had, had gone on um, probably 10 or so years after, after the advent on it and um, become overly enthused, obsessed with the randomized control trial. Again, not to dismiss the value of, of RCTs at all, but this book questioning the interpretation of the model and, and uh, certain research methods. Um, so just skip into how we perhaps might have practiced before evidence-based medicine. And I know this might mischaracterize things a little bit, but I don't think it does. I think it's a true representation of what has happened. So imagine the world before 1992, of course there was still research and there's been randomized controlled trials since in medicine since the 1950s but the general framework of practice before the early 90s was something to do with expertise and clinical reasoning and logic and judgment and uh, using information from from the patient and and uh, tapping into the clinician's own knowledge and memories of events before and mixing all that up and, and and some people refer to that as clinical reasoning in physiotherapy we've got explicit uh clinical reasoning frameworks which have been um hugely informative in terms of clinical practice and people like mark jones and joy higgs and darren rivet should be applauded for, for for what they did um but the question is now, so if, if all this sort of clinical reasoning was based on reasoning and logic and piecing things together, um, then, uh, I mean, if, again, if you look at those old diagrams, you can see um, that the, the early proponents of clinical reasoning were still keen on, um, you know, inputting different sources of information into the uh, therapeutic patient alliance and decision making process but the emphasis was very much on what was found in in the patient and less emphasis on on um, external sources of root uh, of, of um, ev evidence um, so we could say that 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 model of clinical reasoning was challenged in the early 1990s by the advent of evidence-based practice evidence-based medicine now evidence-based healthcare um, and if you look at the wording of the original so this is this is the very first paper that presented the idea of evidence-based medicine by um, the EBM working group at McMaster University in Canada um, there's some really interesting wording you know we don't need to read all of this now but they juxtaposed suppose the former paradigm the paradigm that i've just been talking about that i presented as clinical reasoning in a mark jones-esque way and they position that next to the new paradigm the one they wanted the one they were proposing should supersede uh, the way health care workers practiced and you know there's some really interesting comments in the absence of systematic observations one must be cautious in the interpretation of information derived from clinical experience and intuition from for it may at times been misleading they were being a bit soft in this word in here that word in really hardened up over the next few years to the point where it said you know do not trust what you know your your own experiences you should always question them it's too much bias within the within human nature to be able to make future judgments on what you've seen before so uh, they're saying the answer for that is something less biased less prone to bias systematic observations that that, that are based on the scientific method um, the rationales for diagnosis and treatment which follow from basic pathological principles may in fact be incorrect so the question in mechanistic levels of evidence even and saying even if you know the sort of at a laboratory level if you can work out what causes what um, in the absence of, of of group comparisons in population studies that information might be misleading and again in physiotherapy 
that's you know we've relied a lot of, on that way of thinking mechanistic reasoning if this segment is stiff then it would result in that sort of movement dysfunction so we must and, and making some causal inferences from that that was something that um was proposed to be um questioned heavily understanding certain rules of evidence is necessary to correct to correctly interpret literature on causation, prognosis, diagnostic success, and treatment strategy. So again, they were presenting a, a different framework, a set of rules saying, basically, the new rules are to use um, information from systematic large group observational studies that compare one group against another and control one group and, and intervene on the other. And, and that, that should be our leading way of, of information. So, so the, it, it begs the question, then what's happened to the old clinical reasoning model? Can that still have a place? Should we truly trust the evidence as the slogan goes in terms of the evidence being prioritized um, systematic observation studies like um, high quality um, observation studies or randomized controlled trials. So my suggestion is there might be a way of uh, resolving that conflict and blending, blending the old with the new, the former with the new. Um, but that's probably easier said than done. And it, there's a few challenges on the way. But I think in order, in order to reach a, a sort of, I suppose we're pointing towards a, a a new new model of practice which which embraces everything that the traditional clinical reasoning logic based uh, frameworks offered with the scientific systematic observation framework of practice um, in order to do that we need to deconstruct both of those models now the clinical reasoning model has been deconstructed no end of times and we can easily see the holes in that in terms of human bias so i'm going to emphasize the deconstruction of the evidence based model and see and see where that leaves us so first of all um i present what i call the em empirical problem of evidence based healthcare and basically all that is saying uh, and there is a big paradox here uh, it's saying what scientific data have we got that challenges the, ev the the trustworthiness of the evidence-based model and the paradox there is quite obvious we're using scientific methods to understand whether there's a problem with scientific methods it's an old um, socratic paradox of inquiry nevertheless we do have some data that, that sort of makes us question um, what's going on here uh, most famously, um, the work of John Yiannidis, uh, a Greek academic medic who's taken it upon himself and his team to explore the, the, the trends and the patterns and the errors within the um, evidence-based medicine and scientific paradigm as used in healthcare. Now, again, we've got to be really cautious here because we've all seen the, this sort of work that, that could be misinterpreted as something like oh see i told you so science doesn't work rcts don't work that's that's not what i nor people like john Yonardis have said it's saying look we're, we're making good headway here with with what we do in science and healthcare but it isn't perfect there are problems and and these are them and they're easy to miss if you don't don't look at them so this was an early um an early study which basically looked at the findings of lots and lots of highly cited high impact factor published randomized controlled trials and basically looked at whether they were right or wrong um, judged against another reference standard and and basically concluded that most of the findings were were false and and um, that then led to other people thinking well what is it about this system then that's producing so many scientific errors. Um, this is um, just another example of this sort of work. This is a chap, uh, Vaz, who I met in Glasgow, I think, at the, uh, the last IFOM conference, who produced a systematic, uh, um, a review, again, sort of scientifically presenting the fact that systematic reviews cannot inform clinical practice for all the reasons we're talking about they miss they miss the complexity and context sensitivity of 
what we try to get to the bottom of in a clinical reasoning model. Um, myself and a, a, a team um, from uh, Nottingham uh, at that time, those people have since drifted off, repeated some of Unardis's work with physiotherapy trials. Um, but we sort of developed the methodology so there was a more robust way of establishing what is, is truth or not. If you want the details of that, you can go and read, um, read that study. You'd have to be fairly familiar with Bayesian statistics to really understand it, but um, we tried to make it as clear as possible. But essentially, it said the same thing. Just over half of all physiotherapy trials um, were wrong. Now, you might therefore say, well, yeah, that's why we have systematic reviews, because they then work out which, which trials are more prone to bias and which aren't. So we, within this study, we, um, we looked at that and basically did a regression analysis to look at what variables of a trial uh, predicted whether it would be true or false. And interestingly, the higher quality ones in terms of risk of bias judgment, so randomization, allocation, concealment, etc., um, if they were generally higher quality trials, they were more likely to be wrong, which is very interesting. And the greatest predictor, if you're interested, in what would make a randomized controlled trial wrong was whether it included intention to treat analysis. Um, randomization uh, was the only predictor of a truth trial. So if, if a trial was truly randomized, it is slightly more likely to be true than false. So um, again, this just led us to questions about, well, what on earth is going on with the evidence-based healthcare model? If, if it's core and, and most prioritized research methods, were were not doing what they were supposed to be doing again i'll reinforce that caveat about just having the side of your minds or the back of your minds the thought that this isn't something to do with dismissing the value of science this is the opposite it's it's a sign it's a philosophy of science inquiry in order to try and improve uh, the science that we that we use. Um, there, there are many um, studies like this now. This is just um, a fairly random selection of a study that's also looked at. A, very interesting, you know. It, it looks at nice guidance or nice guidelines for a particular things versus non nice guidelines. A way of practicing based on what could be seen as the ultra clinical reasoning model so you would expect that if nice guidelines have been informed by the best of the evidence and big committees and big uh, working parties have sat down for for some months and years to develop this scientifically informed nice guideline you would expect if you then trialed that and had one group as the nice guideline group and another group as the non nice guideline group relying on 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 clinical intuition expertise etc you would predict very strongly that the people who had nice guideline treatment would do better than the others but studies like this have, have repeatedly shown that that's often not the case at all and actually guideline based treatment is often worse than non guideline based treatment so again what on earth is going on um it's really important to remember as as responsible professional health workers and scientists, uh, clinical scientists, researchers, whatever you want to call yourself, that history hasn't finished. We haven't found the answer to, to go in about the ways. So we, ca we can't be as overly enthusiastic about something like randomized controlled trials as we might like to be we've all we've always got to keep in mind that no matter where we are in history it's not the end of history it's just part of history where do we go from here and um you know we need we need to look at those cracks at where the light's getting in which we've just seen um and explore what's going on beyond beyond the cracked door there um so now we're more sort of so if we present that as the empirical problem there seems to be 
um, inconsistencies and uncertainties with what the best of our prioritized research methods are giving us, um, then we need to look at the problem beyond what the sci scientific methods themselves can give us and get beyond that paradox of inquiry. So that's where philosophy comes in. Philosophy is a, uh, a great tool for exploring the things that science can't um, reach. Um, and if the two work together, philosophy and science, we start to get a much more meaningful interpretation of the true world. So, um, I mean, this is a picture of Austin Bradford Hill, one of the, well, the first trialist in, in medicine. And, you know, arguably he was a philosopher. The, he, he sort of, uh, inverted commas, invented the randomized control trial. Of course, he, he didn't invent it. The idea of controlling groups and comparing themselves against each other is steeped in, in history all the way through um, each century of, of history. Um, in the Bible, in the book of Daniel, the first randomized control trial is is described um, with one field of cows having nutritious food and one field of cows not and seeing what happens to them. So that idea of, of controlling one group and, and seeing what happens and comparing it to the other one is, is not new. But what people like Austin um, Bradford Hill did was, was convert that thinking into healthcare and medicine. And you had to sit down and ponder on how you would do that. So, you know, philosophy um, instigated what we do in terms of randomized control trials. So we could ask philosophical questions, and this is a beautiful way of thinking about it. Does it work? That depends on what you mean by does it and work. You know, philosophy is all about breaking down the detail and really understanding what what's at play here so if we pick up on one of those words work because that's what we're interested in you know the whole idea of predicting what is going to make somebody better is steeped in in the idea of causation so the word work is a causal term it means it does something it means it causes a change it, it makes something happen it does something so so from now on i'm going to be talking about the the philosophical and scientific notion of causation and where that fits in the current evidence-based healthcare model and how it could be looked at differently to inform a new world model of scientifically informed person-centered medicine. So, um, Adam Lacaze, who's um, a me medical philosopher, I suppose, um, wrote some beautiful papers a few years ago. Um, this is just a quote from one of them, exploring the idea of hierarchies in evidence-based medicine. Now, I am gonna talk about the traditional hierarchy of evidence-based medicine here, the old triangle with systematic reviews at the top and things like clinical experience at the bottom. You might think, um, or others might think that that's an old uh, interpretation of evidence-based uh, healthcare, but it's, it's not at all. I mean, if you look at the new models of evidence-based healthcare, like GRADE, for example, which is the most up-to-date um, framework we have for understanding evidence-based healthcare, they do make an explicit attempt to not use the word hierarchy, but they do use the word levels. And they claim things like there is no hierarchy in, in evidence-based healthcare. Basically, the, you look for the best scientific method or research method. Notice how I'm separating the terms science and research out from each other because a lot of the research we do do is not scientific, but that's another story. Um, so um, grade say, there is no hierarchy. They say choose the best method to suit the clinical problem. And then they present their grades, their levels of evidence, and say things like this leveling includes observational studies, which can be upgraded to the quality of a randomized control trial if, cert if there's certain quality features about that observation study. 
and a randomized control trial can be downgraded to the level of an observation study. They're still talking about a hierarchy and the priority prioritization of well controlled um, low risk of bias randomized control trials is still very much the the preferred and prioritized research method. So we can still frame that in the traditional triangular hierarchy. So a simple sentence here that is obvious to, to you all, evidence from studies higher up the hierarchy more reliably informs therapeutic decisions. That is the central characteristic, that is the core of evidence-based healthcare. That's what the whole thing is based on, that certain methods, the ones that sit higher up the hierarchy, more reliably inform therapeutic decisions. So that's what we'll have as our statement to, to challenge. Now, so let's just go back to that hierarchy. This is how it works. You've seen this a thousand times, right from the early 90s onwards. If we draw a line there, this shows basically the difference that evidence-based healthcare would present as causal claims versus non-causal claims. In other words, if you go up to the level of cohort studies, uh, you haven't sufficiently controlled uh, a group to make causal claims. It is just what we wrongly actually refer to as correlation, but let's just stick with that for now. So below the red line, the dotted red line are correlational associations and above the dotted red line are causal associations or claims. So this is really interesting. This offers us, it offers a philosopher an exact um, tool to understand what evidence-based healthcare means as causation, because we've got a line there that says this isn't a cause, this is a cause. The difference between and it there's no point now in talking about correlation versus causation we need to look deeper at what the nature of cause, causation is and there it is so let's just um break this down a little bit this is a, a conceptualization of a simple randomized controlled trial where you recruit somebody you randomize them into one group or another one group receives an intervention the other no intervention and the outcomes are, are analyzed. So let's think about this. You recruit somebody <coughs> um, and they go into one or, one or two of those groups. Um, <coughs> so imagine that somebody's been allocated to receive intervention A and they receive it and they have a certain outcome. So imagine if that had been done in a non-controlled study. We're saying here that somebody had a certain effect and they had a certain outcome. According to the evidence-based model, what we would say is we don't know if the intervention was the cause of the outcome because there are so many confounding variables that because we've got nothing to compare it against where we controlled those confoundings, uh, we can't say that intervention A um, caused the outcome. Okay, so we know that. I'm not telling you anything new here, I'm just telling you, just, just sort of clarifying this. So what we do, we add a control group, and then we can say, well, actually in this control group, the people didn't have as good outcome as that group, so therefore we do some nifty statistical analysis and say there was a certain difference between these and that difference was significant and so we can now make a causal claim that this intervention a caused the outcome here now <clears throat> this is this is really interesting this is what is known as the counterfactual um idea of causation and again, you can trace this back to philosophers such as David Hume. Um, so something happened in the in the intervention group and it didn't happen in the control group. But it took the control group 
for us to believe what happened in the allocation group. So as a human being, we didn't believe what happened in the allocation group until we saw what happened in the in the control group. OK. Our belief of causation was based on a on a world, on a group where something didn't happen, the counterfactual group, the, the group where it didn't happen, the facts weren't there. Now, if you think about this, this is really odd because nothing at all has changed in the um, in the intervention group. The cause was always there. It just took something completely removed from the intervention for us as humans to believe that the cause was there. That's the essence of counterfactual conditions, counterfactual causation. The cause was still there in the intervention group. So it could have still been there if it was an observation study. It was there, but it took an observation of a counterfactual for, for us to believe it. And that's a very problematic position for a philosopher to base causal claims on counterfactuals. Really, the causation should be examined within the group that it happened with. And our causal beliefs should come from within that not from within a counterfactual condition. So Hume sort of developed his idea of causation, which we're going to sort of suggest um, is, is not fit for purpose. And what we've just seen in the evidence-based hierarchy is what we can call a Humean idea of causation. And just to break that down a bit further, what that means is there's three elements to causation contiguity, temporal priority, and constant conjunction. And we see all these features in well-controlled observation studies or randomized control trials. So contiguity um, mean, basically means two, two events um, happen close to each other in sort of time and space. It would be odd to say that a, a, a cause three miles away two years ago created an effect right now so so the 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 two variables the cause and the effect have to be close together temporal priority a cause should always come before an effect and constant conjunction you should see that same cause and effect lots and lots of times which is why we which is why we want population studies so so the sorts of methods we prioritize in healthcare are very human in nature. The, the idea of cause, the, the causal theory of evidence-based healthcare is human in essence. Now Hume dismissed a fourth criteria for causation, um, which he called necessary connection. And that isn't a typo. That's how um, 18th century Scottish philosophers spelt connection. Um, so what this is, this is essentially mechanistic understanding of what a cause is. So a laboratory study, um, he dismissed that in the same way that evidence-based healthcare dismissed it. So Hume and evidence-based healthcare are both on the same hymn sheet. They're both saying, yep, yeah, in order for a cause, we need, to, we need to see it close to each other. We need to see the cause before the effect and we need to see it con constantly happen. And we need to see that happen within um a counterfactual situation as well so again to reiterate our our present idea of causation in healthcare is human in nature so now what i'm going to suggest is why that is not fit for purpose um here's a video if i can get this to play of a simple model um of what we can call a complex system probably the simplest complex system you could get. Now, the idea is, if you look at the yellow arm and the behavior of the yellow arm, it's the behavior of the arm is influenced by the movement of the, the other um, five arms there and the rotation of the, of the uh, hub in the middle. Now, this, is in, this was a picture from the Museum of Science in Glasgow. And it was the point of them having this exhibition there was to show how complex systems work and how they're unpredictable. So what's happened with this with this simple machine is computers have tried to predict the behavior of the yellow arm and the highest powered 
um, computers using the best predictive modeling over the decades have been unable to predict the behavior of that arm because it is part of a complex system. And even though the computers know the behavior of the other variables in the complex system, they still can't predict the behavior of the yellow arm. Now, this is what we're trying to do in healthcare. We're trying to predict the behavior of the yellow arm. That could be somebody's pain response. It could be somebody's behavior. It could be somebody's uh, activity levels. Uh, it could be somebody's response to treatment. It could be somebody's diagnosis. We're trying to predict that, but those, all those things I've just mentioned, diagnosis, response to treatment, behavior, painful experience, are parts of a complex system. Now, from a reductionist science point of view, we could say, well, we just need to look at the other arms more carefully and study them for longer and harder and look at the look at the hub for longer and harder. But we know empirically that doesn't work. You still cannot predict the behavior of a part of a complex system. So if we're trying to base causal claims on something fairly regular, like Hume wanted to, he wanted to regularly see contiguity, regularly see temporal priority, regularly see things happen time and time again and control it all. If you try to, you could control this, you could stop the other arms moving and just see what happens to the yellow arm. But of course, then once you step back out into the real world and say, well, I want to know what happens to the yellow arm when things do move, um, we lose sight of, of, of reality. We've controlled things so much that we, we get a, a misinterpretation of, of what the behavior of that variable is. And that's what our human scientific methods do. They're trying to control the complexity of the world in order to observe uh, one variable. And that is a problem if we assume the world is complex. So what sort of evidence um, can we then use for to make causal claims and predictions about what treatment is going to work uh, on somebody for example so we would just use the example of therapeutics now rather than diagnostics um, here's another video so this is a therapist coming downstairs with a with a patient and the patient um, starts to fall and the therapist puts her hands up to stop him falling now i know this you might say this isn't a um a therapy but it is an intervention and we can we can still talk about it in the same way that we talk about a therapy basically a therapist is intervening in in a situation to in this case maintain the health status of the patient now so so intervention there's the intervention we want to see if that intervention is effective or not so in our model of uh, healthcare, we would set up a randomized control trial and say, well, we'll have one group of people coming down with a therapist who puts up her hands when she judges the patient falling and another group where the patient, uh, the best control would be to remove um, the therapist and just have a patient come down and, and see and see what happens. And then and only then can we make a causal claim about the effectiveness of that intervention. Now that all seems silly and common sense to say, well, of course, of course this causation occurred there. The, the, the cause of the therapist's hands being put up has, has caused an effect. It's, it stopped the patient falling. So we trust that now because we can see, we've, we've observed it, but evidence-based medicine dismisses observations. Now we might say, the reason we believe this is because the effect size is so large. It's quite clear, it's so obvious. It's like somebody, you know, it's like jumping, the old jumping out of a plane without a parachute uh, analogy. The effect size is so obvious that we don't need randomized control trials, and that might be true. So then we might say, well, we only need randomized control trials for interventions that we suspect only have small to medium effects and then we might say well actually don't worry about looking for small effects because if it's just a small effect it probably won't be uh, cost effective anyway so let's just look at interventions where we suspect have um, moderate effect sizes but how do we know that a priori 
Um, so going on the large effect size, it's obvious argument doesn't help. The key, the key point here being made is that there are other sources of evidence that allow us to make causal claims other than outcomes from counterfactual, counterfactually based um, uh, comparative studies. And uh, now I'm going to quickly go over this because Mark and Matt will be um, within the program. We'll be talking about this a lot more, but I'm just going to briefly steal a case of of Matt's, which which you'll see elsewhere, no doubt, to to gain make this point and refer to to Matt's uh, paper. Um, uh, a while ago, um, presenting the case of, of Jack. Um, now, again, I'm not going to go through the details of this in the same way that, that Matt or Mark might, but I'm just saying this is it's a great example. And you, you know these examples anyway, you see them all day, every day. You know, there are lots of variables at, at play in a person's life experience. And if we're seeing them during their painful experience or dysfunctional experience or whatever, we know that that, that 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 human being is the the, the thoughts, the feelings, the behaviours, the the sense the sensory dimensions of that patient are being influenced by so many factors. And we talk about models of healthcare like biopsychosocial, and we can split that mind map up into the bio, the psychosocial, what we want. We can do whatever with it, but we do know that essentially, Jack the dimensions of Jack's existence are simply multiple variables within a very complex system. So this system, this complex system has got far more arms than our model in the science museum. So if we can't predict a variable in the science museum, then how on earth can we predict a variable of Jack's behavior given that his context is so complex? Um, well, we'll try and work that out. Um, the dis, so here's a word that again will come up and you'll start to recognize more and more dispositionalism or causal disp dispositionalism. Now, what dispositionalism does, it's an alternative causal theory to the Humean um, idea of causation. Okay, so dispositionalism doesn't need to rely on contiguity, temporal priority and constant conjunction in order to make causal claims. So in that way, you might say, well, it's not a scientific um, idea of causation because it doesn't do what Hume said causal sciences should, should be doing. Um, but that's the point. The point is to, to say, well, it's it isn't scientific in that sense because that is just one interpretation of what science is. Dispositionalism can still create causal claims based on very systematic thinking and logic and evidence, but doesn't need to rely on the sort of stuff that Hume wanted cause, causal claims to rely on. And this is just what we call a vector model in disposition thinking, where we 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 talk of um, causal factors as tendencies which go one way or the other, and this is just an uh, example that some things tend towards one thing or another. Now, the reason I'm going to use this example is probably slightly different to the way Matt will be using it. I'm just going to sort of start to now think, well, okay, if we if we've modelled and mapped all these all these many variables to Jack's life out in some sort of vector diagram like this then we might say something like, so, so now's the time to think about introducing population data. And we might say something like, well, uh, randomized systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials support the, support the claim that physical activity is, a, is an effective intervention in low back pain. And we can see here that physical activity is something that Jack himself said would tend towards that. So in terms of external validity, uh, we might say, actually, you know, what Jack's saying, at least, ties in with what the um, systematic research is saying. But, and here's the crux, we can't just take physical activity and get Jack to do it and expect an outcome because he's got so more variables that prevent that outcome from happening. So he may know that physical activity or have had experience in the past that physical activity helps him his back pain 
but he can't do that because he's now got fear of some movements and his 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 um, stress levels rise when he tries to do physical activity. It influences anxiety. It sleeps. So all these variables are are interrelated to each other. So we can't just plug randomized control trial level evidence into a complex system because there is no guarantee that it that it's going to work. We need to think about the interactions between all those variables. And all those variables will be very different in, in different people. So we can't even make our judgments based on, let's say we had a, a magnificent randomized control trial that, that somehow convinces that complexity was embraced within its design. Well, that would be fine. But the complexity in the next future case outside of the trial is going to be different to all those different complexities within the trial. So again, there's no way of predicting from a trial what the effect of a future event would would be, unless you base all your thinking on a very strict uh, interpretation of what frequentist probability is. But that that would be um, not not the best thing um, to do. It might work in some very controlled lab lab studies, but it doesn't in in um, the real world. But the data from the population studies does give us a general inclination into the general direction of travel that we want to be going. I.e., physical activity is something that could probably work if only we could get him to do it. But it may well be that that um, another type of intervention would work if we also addressed um, some of those uh, other complex variables. So in terms of prediction, um, we can make some predictions, but they are all real-time, individualized, complex-based predictions. We're not just importing data from a previous experience, whether that is our own experience or a randomized control trial, into a future event. Now, I don't think science is ever going to be able to solve that idea of prediction. It's called the problem of induction. And again, it's a very Aristotelian thing, and Karl Popper wrote about it a lot. And using randomized control trials or nice guidelines or anything is, again, an example of falling straight into the problem of induction. No matter how good quality that a priori data and evidence is, there is still the problem of it all failing and breaking down if you try and in induce your thinking outside of the sample population and scientists and philosophers for for for, for decades and centuries tried to solve that problem what dis, dispositionalism can solve that problem because it says that there is no problem of induction because you're not using any prior data or experience or evidence to predict in a probabilistic sense, um, the best treatment for somebody because that prediction comes in real time from your meaningful understanding of the patient's life experience. But even, so, so to take it the other end, even if you were very successful with Jack and you found that actually addressing his anxiety uh, made him a lot better, you wouldn't, a dispositionist wouldn't then say, right, the next patient I with low back pain, I'm going to address the anxiety because I've seen it then. Or if there was a randomized controlled trial that said addressing anxiety helps, you wouldn't, as a dispositionist, you wouldn't then because a dispositionist understands that the world is complex, context sensitive, and causation comes from within that individual complex, context sensitive situation. Um, so, Dispositionalism, a new model of causation which challenges a human idea of dispositionalism. I'm going to use a radar graph to say the same thing here. This is what uh, Dave and Jim um, produce. Um, again, I'm only showing these now as, as sort of tools that we can add to our traditional clinical reasoning model that just help us a little step further in understanding piecing together the, com the, the complex variables within a context sensitive situation. And this sort of thinking or modeling 
just gives us another little tool to use to try and think okay what's what's the big problem what's a little problem how do these relate together um but i would i would sort of point people towards uh, reading about some of this stuff but it ties in with an uh, with an alternative thinking in terms of um what our underpinning theory of causation is so again you know um th there are lots of multi-dimensional clinical reasoning frameworks and you can make your own up but the the core principle is that the soon as soon as we say things like context sensitive complex variables multiple variables mu manifesting causal partners this the, as soon as we say those words um whereas we're accepting that the world is complex and we need to separate it out into all those in, uh, variables and see how they relate to each other and not just sort of um, not in a reductionist way of splitting it all up and putting it back together but seeing what the meaningful relationships are so we can only start to do that with a patient listening to their story listening to what they're saying using our logic and evidence and communication skills to build that up to eventually come to an individual decision about what is going to be best for this patient um, and we won't go into it now but then we can then reconceptualize what the nature of expertise is. and of course an expert does use scientific evidence but they that is only one part of their complex thinking and approach to healthcare. What does, an what does an experienced expertise evidence-based therapist look like? Does he just translate trials to, to a situation? No, he'd be communicating with the patient, he'd be thinking what's going on here, he'd be looking for responses within that. Um, so just to start wrapping up, Trish Greenell's uh, sort of five points on real evidence-based medicine or real evidence-based healthcare again tying with what we've been saying make the ethical care of the patient the top priority individualize evidence real evidence-based healthcare is characterized by expert judgment we share decisions in meaningful conversations and we and then we apply these to a community level so not population data down shop floor data up um so <clears throat> if we think of cause not so much as a as a two separate variables cause and effect in a human sense but if we think about cause as a process that is productive and the effect is about the process then we start to think differently about our clinical reason and use of evidence-based medicine uh, we support an idea of evidential pluralism in which um, true causal claims will only come about when all types of scientific methods and all types of observations start pointing in the same direction. So rather than having a hierarchy that says, well, clinical observation says this, but randomized control trials says that, so randomized control trials win, we would say, no, we, we still need to continue looking at this problem scientifically until we start to get outcomes that all say in the same thing. So the observation study says the same as the mechanistic studies, as the randomized control trials, as our clinical experience. Then we can start to make true meaningful causal claims. We're not talking about personalized medicine here. We're talking about person-centered medicine. Uh, so if we really want to understand the differences between uh, Just Naylor and Hank Williams, we need a true person-centered approach. What's our research vision? Following on from that, contextualize population data. Reconceptualize the fundamental ideas of causation. Embrace our complexity, don't control for it. We, we need to stop controlling for complexity. This is the big problem. Work across disciplines, especially the humanities. Work work with the social sciences and sociologists and philosophers in, in designing uh, methods and interpreting data. Place people, not patients, at the heart of our research. Thank you very much.